To check out all our products, go to musicnomadcare.com. Hey, it's Ram and the Music Nomad. This video is designed to show you how to set up your guitar using Music Nomad's Keep It Simple Setup Method. The KISS process uses our precision gauges and tools combined with step-by-step -step general guidelines anybody can follow and set up their guitar to play and sound great. To get the job done right, you will need our six-piece precision gauge set that includes a truss rod gauge and pick capo, string action gauge, radius gauge set, nut height gauge, and a 24-page instructional booklet. All of these uniquely designed to make the process much easier and precise than other gauges out there. The three Music Nomad tool sets are a 26-piece Guitar Tech screwdriver and wrench set, 11-piece truss rod wrench set, and a diamond-coated nut file set. With these four kits, you are able to set up most all guitar and basses out there. Before you get started on your setup, there are some pre-setup steps you should do. Remove all your strings with the Music Nomad grip cutter. With the strings now off, and with the Music Nomad radius gauge, Measure and make a note of the fretboard radius as you will need this info when you measure the string radius in the setup process. Tighten all screws, including the tuning machine bushings with Music Nomad's Guitar Tech tool set. Polish your frets with Music Nomad's Frying Fret Polish. Clean and condition the fretboard with Music Nomad's F1 oil. Clean the body and neck with Music Nomad cleaners. Finally, put new strings on with Music Nomad's Grip Winder. Okay, now you're ready to start the setup, featuring our talented guest guitar tech who will lead you through the process. Have fun. Hi, I'm Jeff Luttrell with San Francisco Guitar Works and Sonoma County Guitar Works, here to set up a Gibson Les Paul using Music Nomad's Keep It Simple setup method. With the goal of making setups accessible to everyone, my collaboration with Music Nomad has created a simple setup process with the goal of helping you make your guitar play and sound great. Let's get started. The first part of the flow is the setting of the neck relief, and you'll measure that with your truss rod gauge and you'll adjust it with your truss rod uh, adjustment nut at the headstock or the heel. The next step on a fixed radius bridge will be setting your bridge radius by filing the sa individual saddles to achieve the same radius at the bridge that you have at the fretboard. You will, after you've set your radius, you'll then set your action height, and you'll do that by measuring your string action at the 12th fret with your string action gauge. After that, you'll move down to the nut. Uh, you'll measure your nut heights using your nut action gauge, and then you'll file your nut slots to the correct height. After that, you'll move down and set your intonation at the bridge, and then lastly, we'll set your pickup heights. So the first thing that we're gonna do on this guitar is we're going to measure the neck relief. Now, what neck relief is, is the amount of curvature in the neck from front to back. If you have a guitar or bass neck that looks like a banana, it's very curved in a concave way, that would be said to have a lot of relief or excessive relief. If you have a neck that's perfectly flat, so you put a straight edge on the frets, it touches all the frets, you would have zero relief. If you have a neck that's bent backwards, that would be called back bow. Relief is crucial to a really nice playing guitar. If you don't have enough relief in the neck, you will often have buzzing in the low registers and you'll have an uneven action because the action at the bridge needs to be raised in order to create space for the vibrating string. So you'll have a very low action in the first position and then it will diverge pretty significantly and it'll feel very high up at the top. When you have uh, too much relief, what you'll have is a high action in the center of the neck and sometimes it will buzz in the middle because the end of the neck is coming up because the neck is so curved. So if you have a low action, it's gonna be very buzzy in the center of the neck. When you have your relief set correctly, you will have just enough curvature in the neck that the string has room to vibrate. The string is pinched or is held fixed at either end. So when you pluck the string, it generally vibrates in an oval section. The center of the string has the largest oscillation pattern. The string does some, some whipping and has some other uh, overtones and vibrations as it's settling in, but generally the center is the largest arc. So having a little relief in the neck creates a pocket for that string to vibrate in. <clears throat> so by having that little bit of relief, we'll be able to have a very even action all the way up the neck with, uh, with no buzzing uh, anywhere on the fretboard. 
So the first step for me here is to measure my neck relief. So I'm going to use my truss rod gauge and my pit capo in this process. So the first thing I'll do is I'll take my pit capo and I'm going to put it over the low E string, under the A string, and over the D string. And then I'm going to slide it up to the first fret. And there's a mark right on the capo showing you where to put the first fret. Now what this is doing is this is holding the string down at the first fret. Because what we will now do is putting the guitar in the playing position, I'm going to fret the low E string at the 12th fret. And I've now created a straight edge between the first fret and the 12th fret. And I will use that straight edge to measure my neck radius uh, against. Grabbing my truss rod gauge, I will select the right gauge for this guitar. So printed right on the printed right on the gauges are the uh, measurement, the thickness of the gauge. We've got a six thousandths of an inch, an eight thousandths of an inch, and a ten thousandths of an inch, and what guitar each one of those would be used for. I'm going to use the six thousandths of an inch for the electric guitar. And what I will do with this is I'm going to, after I fret it at the twelfth fret, I will put this gauge on top of the sixth fret and slide it underneath the low E string. So at that point, there will be three possible conditions, and we'll use the touch rule to decide what we're working with. So if I push the gauge between the string and it heavily touches the fret and the string, then I have a heavy touch and I have too little relief in the neck, and I will need to turn my truss rod nut counterclockwise to allow more relief into the neck. If I put the gauge on top of the fret and under the string, and I have a large gap, or any gap, between the gauge and the string, I will know I have too much relief, and I will need to tighten the truss rod by turning the nut clockwise. If I put the gauge between the fret and the string, and I have a perfect fit, it just, just barely touches the string and the fret, then I have the exact relief measurement that I'm looking for. So on this guitar, and I'm going to have to put on my cheaters here, for everybody, even if you have good eyes, a set of uh, cheap cheaters will help you see these measurements a lot easier if you're having trouble. So right now, I will go ahead and fret at the 12th fret. I will put my gauge under the string. And this has just a little too much relief in the neck. I can see a gap between the gauge and the string. So I'm going to go ahead and tighten this truss rod. This guitar has a truss rod cover over the truss rod nut, so I'm going to get a Phillips screwdriver to remove the two screws that are holding the truss rod cover on. Uh, just so happens that in the Music Nomad truss rod kit, my 5 16 wrench that I'll use for adjusting the truss rod also has a Phillips head uh, screwdriver on the end. Now these screws are very easy to lose. They, if you drop them, they slide down the headstock and off onto the floor. This happens to be a magnetic tip, so I don't have that problem with this. And now I've gained access to the truss rod nut. Now before we make any adjustments on the guitar, it is important to make sure that the guitar is in tune through all of these steps. You want to ensure that you have proper string tension on the neck before you take any measurements or make any adjustments. So I have the proper wrench to adjust my truss rod and a couple of things when you're uh, going to adjust a truss rod nut. If you go to adjust it, you want to tighten it or loosen it. If it feels stuck, just don't force it. Um, if, it, if you really feel like you're having to put a lot of tension on it, just stop. It may be, it may be seized, it could be that's out of threading and the nut is buried on the end, it could just be rusted. Yeah, you'll want to, uh, first of all, you'll want to try going backwards on that and loosening the nut, try to break it loose. Uh, and if you just feel like you're in over your head at that point, just take it down to your local shop. Um, so on this guitar, I need to tighten the truss rod. So I'm going to put my wrench on my truss rod nut and I'm going to tighten it about an eighth of a turn. Just give it a little snug there. Now I'll put my guitar back in the playing position. So now I'll take my truss rod gauge and I'll remeasure between my sixth fret and the string. And at this point the gauge is just perfectly sliding between the string and the fret. So I have the proper amount of relief for this guitar. The three measurements that are provided on the truss rod gauge were developed over many years of doing fret work and setup work by hand, and then seven years now of having a Plec machine to do our fret work. 
And we have found that for the majority of the instruments, these settings for truss rod relief just work really well for most players. And by providing the three measurements right on this gauge, which doesn't have the messy oil like a standard set of feeler gauges, we made it a really easy to use tool that has exactly what you need and doesn't have a bunch of extra gauges that you probably won't use. So now we've set our neck to the proper relief measurement and we'll move down to the bridge and set the bridge radius first. I've measured my fretboard radius and I know that it's a 12 inch radius, so I will set my bridge to that same measurement. To do that, I will use my Music Nomad radius gauge. And the, this has a four different radius per gauge and we're going to use the 12 inch curve. Uh, so you know the way that the measurements are used, you have a, the, a seven and a quarter radius. This curve is part of a circle that has a seven and a quarter radius, so a 14 and a half inch circle. So a very tight curve. If you go up to a 20 inch radius, it's very flat because that is a section of a circle that has a 20 inch radius, so it's a 40 inch circle, so it's much flatter. So that's what these uh, numerical uh, designations represent. It's a, a section of a circle that has that radius. So now I'll take my 12 inch radius gauge and I'm going to, I like to lift the guitar up and look down the strings. So I'll take my radius gauge and I'll set it on the strings in front of the saddles, about a quarter inch in front of the saddles. And I will just look at each string and I will see what string is touching the gauge. Now, if you have trouble, and I can see right here that my G is a little low. If you have trouble seeing each little string contact point, you can rest the gauge lightly on the strings and then pluck the strings and listen for the string to buzz against the gauge. That's a good way to determine if a string is not touching. You can put the radius gauge on the strings and push it up and down just very gently and you should be able to see which strings are moving and which strings are not. So when I do that, I can see that all five of, five of my strings are moving, but the G is not, so it's low. So now that I've measured the arc of my bridge, and, and don't be surprised on your guitar if it doesn't match any gauge. You know, you might put on a seven and a quarter and it hits a couple and you flip it over to a 12 and it hits a different set because most guitars that come out of the factory, they've never had a radius gauge put on the bridge. Even if they've been to a shop and been set up, they may not have been done this way. And this really ensures the most consistent playability across the fretboard matching the bridge radius correctly to the neck radius. So just you're gonna, you just wanna use the one that matches your neck and that's what you're gonna match your bridge to. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn the, lay this guitar down and get ready to file my saddle slots. I'm gonna file at a downward angle towards the back of the bridge. The reason for that is I want the string to have a very clean contact point at the front of the bridge saddle. If the bridge saddle is flat on the top or even falls away a little bit towards the neck, you can get overtones and you can get buzzing. That's, you, can, you may think it's fret buzz. It's hard to diagnose. So cutting at a downward angle ensures that the string vibrates very cleanly and clearly on the bridge saddle. In order to file the saddles, I'll need to select the right nut files for this string set. This is a set of 10 to 46s. Uh, you may play nines, maybe you play 11s, but on your string pack, they will list the individual gauges of each string. So what, you'll do, what I will do on this guitar is knowing that this is a 10, 13, 17, 26, 36, 46, I will try to get those exact number files or slightly larger if I don't have exactly that. You can, you can run a file that's exactly the same size as a string up to around three thousandths of an inch larger and still maintain a slot that's narrow enough to uh, prevent the string from vibrating in the slot and is still wide enough to allow the string to glide smoothly so that you don't have tuning issues. This guitar has a low G string, so I'm gonna need to file the other five saddles down until the gauge lowers and contacts the G and maintains contact with the other five strings. So this is kind of the most work that you'll have to do on a tunematic is when you have one low string. It's usually not like that. It's usually a couple are low and you bring down the others and, and reach that. But if you have one low one, you have to do all five saddles. So I've got 
my work cut out for me here. I'm going to start with the low E string. I'll pop the string out of the saddle and I will get my proper size nut file for my 46 string. So the cool thing about these files is you can use them with the handle or without. Um, sometimes when I'm starting a new nut slot, I'll use them without the handle just for a little better visibility. If I'm cutting existing nut, I'll use them with the handle because it's really uh, ergonomic and easy to control, but I'll just use them both ways so you can get an example of how you can, how you can use them to best suit your needs. So I'll start here on the low E string and I'm going to come in and I'm going to file this saddle about five times. I'll put my string back in the slot, put the guitar back up, and I'm going to remeasure. So now my gauge is, I've lowered my E string. I can see that because now my gauge is rocking on the D. So now I'm going to cut the D string down. So I'll pop that out of the slot, grab my 28. As you can see, I'm filing at a slight downward angle towards the back of the bridge, and that's going to ensure that the string contacts the saddle at the back, rides up the saddle, and then goes straight out towards the neck without any uh, buzzing or any overtones. Pop that back in, bring it back up. Okay, now I am lower, I'm closer to my B, or closer to that G. So I'm gonna bring down the B and the E string. Pop the, pop the B out of the slot. If you have five strings that need to come down, you can just file all five of them a little bit at one time and then remeasure uh, rather than trying to do one saddle at a time. Okay, so now I'm much, much closer in there. My A is still a little bit high, but I'm pretty much in the ballpark. So I'm gonna use my A string. And that is it. I don't have a gap between any of the strings and the gauge. I've got a perfect 12 inch radius. And now my action is gonna be very even across my fretboard because my string radius at my bridge matches the fretboard radius. I'm gonna go ahead and leave my files out because I'll be using those for the nut slots uh, coming up. But before that, we're going to set our action height. So with my string action gauge, and my pick capo, I will measure my action height and set my bridge height to achieve the most common action for this instrument. So with my pick capo, again, over the E string, under the A, and over the D, slide that up to the first fret. Now I'll put my guitar back in the playing position. This is the string action gauge that you'll use to measure the height of the string above the 12th fret. Now this is a really great tool. Um, you'll use this a lot. If you do any setup work on your guitars, even if you just wanna know how they're set up, you know anything about them measurement-wise, this has got you covered. Uh, we designed this to be really readable. It uh, has a white etching on a black background, so the lines and measurements really pop. Uh, with the uh, more common silver gauges with the black marking, they can be really hard to see. The, if a shadow gets on them or if they get a little dirty, the black and the gray just do not have enough contrast. So the white on the black background is very, very easy to see. Um, we have uh, your measurements in thousandths of an inch, in sixty-fourths, and in metric uh, millimeters. So you have all three ways to measure your action, just depending on how you like to, to think about measurements. And then we have uh, on the uh, front and back, the most common action heights for electric guitar, acoustic guitar, and bass in both uh, metric and in SAE. So really useful, really easy to read. So with the guitar still in tune, I'm going to measure my action height. Uh, on this guitar, I didn't need to detune to make any of my saddle adjustments, but if you have had to detune for any reason, you always wanna make sure that your guitar is at pitch before you start any of these measurement processes. I'm going to use the thousandths of an inch scale to measure my string action height. So what I'll do is I'll find that scale here on my gauge, 
and I'll put that behind the low E string at the 12th fret. I'm looking for what line meets the bottom of the string at the 12th fret. Now, an, an easy way to do this is you can, if you're using the thousandths of an inch gauge, you can take your 20 thousandths line and just put it right on the 12th fret. Chances are that's gonna be well below the bottom of your string. Then you can slide your gauge to the left and you'll move your 30 thousandths line to the 12th fret, 40, 50, and now what I'm seeing is that the string is right on top of the 0.06 line. So that 60 thousandths of an inch that the string is above the fret. The low E string action on this guitar is 60 thousandths of an inch, and that corresponds to the most common action for an electric guitar on your chart here. Um, 60 thousandths on the bass side and 50 thousandths on the treble side is an action height measurement that probably 90% of the players out there would be comfortable with. It's not too high, it's not too low, it plays pretty clean, you can bend, um, but it's not a, it's just a, it's a very usable action for most players. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave my bass side at 60 thousandths, then I'm gonna move over to my high E and I'm going to measure that. So I'll move my pick capo over. <clears throat> Now with the guitar in the playing position again, I'm going to put my gauge behind the high E string and I'm going to see what line meets the string. And this is at 0 0.07, so 70 thousandths of an inch. If I look at my chart and my low medium action, which is the most common for this type of guitar, it calls for a 50 thousandths action height on the high E string. So my action is a little high on the high side. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower my bridge in order to achieve 50 thousandths of an inch action at the 12th fret. On this tunematic bridge, the action height is adjusted by turning these thumb wheels. Uh, the thumb wheels are part of a post that the bridge rests on. If you turn the thumb wheel clockwise, it drives the post into the body and lowers the bridge. If you turn the thumb wheel counterclockwise, it unscrews the post from the body and it lifts the bridge. So I'm going to turn this thumb wheel clockwise and lower the high E string. If you have trouble turning this, you, uh, you may want to detension your strings um, so that you can turn it, or you can use a spanner wrench on the thumb wheel itself and you can use it to turn the thumb wheel. One end of the wrench will turn it clockwise, the other end of the wrench will turn it counterclockwise. So this is really handy if you have a, a bridge that's very hard to turn the wheels for some reason. Sometimes the angle will make them bind a little bit or it's just the pressure of the strings. So I'm gonna lower this down a little bit and I'm gonna to need to retune my guitar. So now that my guitar is back in tune, I'm going to remeasure my high E string action. So I'll put the guitar back in the playing position, get my string action gauge, my thousandth scale. I'm gonna put that behind the string. Well, now I'm down to about 60 thousandths of an inch, so I'm gonna to wanna to lower it a little bit more. On the Tunematic, it has a thumb wheel uh, and a post on either end of the bridge, so I'm using the treble side post and thumb wheel to lower the treble side action. So now I can recheck that. Just a little bit more on that. I can, if you're coordinated, you can do it in playing position, but sometimes it's a little tricky to get under there. All right, so there I am set perfectly at 50 thousandths of an inch on the treble side. So now I have my bridge radius set and my string action height set correctly. The next step will be cutting the nut slots to their proper height. The nut is a very important component of the guitar. It's probably the cause for more tuning woe uh, than any other single component on an instrument. If the nut slots are cut too tight, the strings will bind in the slot and you'll have tuning issues. You may have had or currently have a guitar that when you tune, you can hear the string pinging as it goes through the nut. It doesn't tune smoothly. That's a very sure sign that the guitar has nut slots that are not cut correctly. Uh, another more subtle 
issue is uh, you get the guitar in tune and you play the guitar or use your tremolo and the guitar goes very sharp. Um, that is also an indication that the string slots are cut too tight. Uh, the nut is responsible for the way the guitar feels in the first position. Uh, if the nut slots are too high, the string action is going to be very stiff and it can also throw your intonation off if the slots are too high because as you're pressing your string down to the first fret, it's stretching it. And if it stretches it more than is compensated for by this measurement between the nut and first fret, your note will be sharp. So let's get out our nut height gauge and measure our nut height. So this is another cool little set of gauges, very similar to the truss rod gauge. Uh, this one has uh, several several thicknesses of gauge from 12 thousandths of an inch up to 22 thousandths of an inch. And on the most common gauges, the 16, 18, and 20, it has markings to designate what string on what guitar or bass those are to be used. Um, they're really cool. They, uh, they don't have any grease on them or any oil. Uh, you have instructions written right on the package if you forget what you're supposed to do. And it has uh, an indicator about the touch rule, which we'll be using uh, just like we did with the truss rod gauge. So the first thing I'll do is I'll put my guitar back in the playing position. And I'm going to select the proper gauge for the low E string on an electric guitar. Now looking at my gauges, I will see on the 20 thousandths gauge, it designates low E and A guitar. So I'm going to use that gauge for my low E and for also my A string. You don't have to fret the string, you just leave the string open. You'll take the gauge and put it between the string and the first fret. Put it right on top of the fret and right under the string. According to the touch rule, this string is too low. It is touching the gauge pretty heavily. If my string is a little bit too low on the low E string, that's only a problem if the open E string buzzes. So I will check for buzz. The string does not buzz, so I'm going to leave that nut slot alone. I'll move over to the A string now and measure it. So I'm going to come in, I'm going to slide the gauge under the low E string and then to the A. And this string is also, it's moving whenever I push the gauge under the string. So it is definitely lower than spec, but again, does it buzz? And on this guitar, it does not. So we can just continue on over to the D string. So looking at my gauges, that would be the 0 .018 or 18 thousandths of an inch gauge. It's marked on the gauge D and G guitar. So I'll slide that under the E and A string and right under the D. So on this guitar, the D string is also a little lower than spec. So I will again pluck the D. I'm getting no buzzing, so I'm not going to worry about that. Um, we'll move over to the G, come underneath from the treble side. It is low again. The G is a little low, so I'll again pluck the string and I'm not getting any buzz. That's one of the good things about these measurements. They are a little, they're on the safe side. So if you, if you're at this spec, your guitar is going to play in tune and very comfortably and it should be completely buzz free. If you decide that you have a lighter attack and you want to go for a little bit lower action at the nut, you can move down a number on these and use the 0 .018 for your low E and A, the 0 .016 for your D and G, and the 0 .14 for your B and E. So now that I've determined that all four of these strings are a little low, but they're not buzzing, I'm going to sw move down to my uh, 0.016 gauge, which is designated B and high E guitar. I'm going to measure my B string. Now my B is a little high. Got a little bit of a tick there. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to file down that B nut slot in order to uh, close that gap. So I'll put the guitar back down on the cradle cube. So now I'm going to go ahead and file this uh, B nut slot uh, there was a gap between the string and the gauge. And what I want is for the string to just touch the gauge. I want there just to be a very light touch between the fret, the gauge, and the string. Not a heavy touch which moves the string and not a gap which it currently has. 
So on some guitars, you can just pop the string out of the nut slot and set it to the side without detuning. Um, other guitars, maybe they have a very steep headstock angle, you'll need to detune. Um, a couple of things to be aware of, if you uh, take your strings out of the nut slots with them fully tensioned, you can mar the top of the nut and then you'll leave little marks that don't look great. And on a Gibson particularly, whenever you take off your E strings, if you don't detune, you're going to scratch up the curves on the side of the headstock here. I see that so much on Gibsons that come in. The lacquer all along this uh, sweeping curve down to the nut is really chipped up because people will take the strings out without detuning and it really chews up that part of the headstock. So now I will take my uh, 13 file for my 13 gauge string. If you have a, a string that falls between nut file sizes, you can use a file that's up to three thousandths of an inch larger than the string gauge. That size will still be tight enough to keep the string from rattling, but it will provide enough clearance that the string will easily slide through the nut slot, preventing tuning issues. And I'm going to do a similar process that I did at the saddle. I'm going to put my nut file in the string slot and I'm gonna have a slight downward angle towards the headstock. You want the string to contact the nut slot at the headstock end first, go up the nut slot, and then leave the nut front cleanly so that it rings out clearly and doesn't have any overtones or sitaring. So I'm gonna put the nut file in the slot. I'm going to give just a, a few light strokes and blow out the debris. And I'll put my string back in the slot this one didn't need very much, so I didn't uh, didn't do too much filing there, and hopefully I've got it uh, got it right on. So I'll slide this between the high E, and that's just a very light touch. It just barely moves the string as I put it underneath the uh, under the string. So I'm going to call that good, um, and then also I'll double check, make sure that the string doesn't buzz open, and then I'm going to move on to the high E string, which is lower than spec. This is definitely moving moving the string. So I will also check and see check and see if that's buzzing and it's not. So at this point I have nut slots that are a little below spec but they don't buzz. So I'm not going to worry about it. This guitar just has nice low action at the first fret and uh, there's no problems. So now we've set our truss rod, we've set our bridge radius and action height, We've cut the nut slots correctly. Now we'll move on to intonation. Now intonation is the adjustment of the saddle that makes the fretted notes play in tune with the open string. Basically, any guitar, no matter how poorly it plays, if it's just intonated, you can use it for something. Intonation is a really important concept to understand and it's a, a, an important part of the process as far as execution because you really want your guitar to play well in tune. So the way that we'll do this is we'll get our, with the guitar in playing position, we'll get our open string perfectly tuned. And this is one of those times when it really is important that it is just right on the money. Um, a couple of tips. Uh, if you have a tuner that's having a hard time uh, holding on the note, you can turn your tone controls down and those will help the tuner to see the fundamental of the note and it will cut out some of the upper order harmonics and it just makes the tuner uh, more able to grab the note. So I'll go ahead and I turn my tones down. I'm gonna get right in tune. Okay, so that is just dead on the money. The strobe's not moving at all. So now that I'm perfectly in tune with my open string, I'm going to check my 12th fret octave and then I like to go ahead and check the uh, 17th fret as well to make sure that I'm in tune all the way up the neck. So first thing I'll do is I'll check my 12th fret. It's a tiny bit flat. And then I'm gonna check my 17th and it's a tiny bit sharp. So the 12th fret is a tiny bit flat, almost not enough to worry about. The 17th fret is a little bit sharp. On some guitars, you will have a situation with the fret placement where you can't get every note perfectly intonated. So Gibsons have a tendency to run a little sharp in the upper frets. Uh, some other guitar brands are you know, right on the money everywhere. It's just a, different guitars have different idiosyncrasies. 
So what I recommend is if you have a guitar that is uh, not coming into line on both the 12th and the 17th, you can optimize for different parts of the fretboard. Uh, oftentimes on Gibsons, what we'll do is we'll uh, intonate the E, A, and D just perfectly at the 12th fret because most players do not play beyond the 12th fret on those low strings. And then we'll start splitting the difference as we get over to the higher strings. But ultimately, after you intonate your instrument, you're gonna wanna listen around the neck, play chords and stuff wherever it is you play, and just listen for any out-of-tune notes. And you may have to tweak your intonation a little bit for your specific instrument. If you're using a high quality strobe tuner, a little bit of drift is not something that you would be able to hear. I mean, all things considered, if you can nail the intonation perfectly, that is what you should shoot for. But if you have a tiny bit of drift, there's no way you're gonna hear it. So don't stress too much if you can't get every note exact. That's your goal. But if it's just a little bit of a drift, you're not gonna hear it. So what we've got here is tiny, tiny bit of flat and just a tiny bit of sharp. So I'm gonna leave this. So I'm splitting the difference on the Gibson. On the A string, perfectly in tune, definitely a little bit flat. Okay, so I will move on to the D string. Let's get that perfectly in tune. It was a little flat there. And we'll check our 12th fret. That's dead on the money right there. Barely sharp at the 17th fret, but nothing that I would worry about. All right, so now we will go with our G. Get that perfectly in tune. And I did not adjust the G nut slot on this guitar. I don't know if you heard that, but there was a tiny ping whenever I tuned it. That's something you're always gonna to wanna to listen for. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a little bit of tune it in that nut slot. So I'm gonna take just a little bit of tune it and apply it to the applicator. And I'll pull the G string out of the nut. Put a little bit of tune it in there. And then I can work that back and forth. Now it's nice and smooth, no pinging, no noise. All right, so let's get that tuned back to pitch. So that's right on the money. Okay, we're sharp at the 12th fret and we're sharp at the 17th as well. So if your fretted notes are sharp in comparison to the open string, your scale length is too short and you're gonna to need to move the saddle back to lengthen the scale. If your fretted notes are too flat, you're going to need to move the saddle forward to shorten the scale length uh, to compensate for that flatness. So on this bridge, the way the saddles are adjusted, they have a screw coming through the bridge base through the saddle and I'm going to tighten the screw and it's gonna pull the saddle backwards. So that's going to lengthen my scale and it's going to flatten these fretted notes. So I'm gonna move the saddle backward by tightening this screw. Uh, if you were, if you had, if the bridge was flipped around, you would turn the screw the opposite direction, but you want this, the saddle to go backwards if the fretted note is sharp. So I'm gonna tighten this screw and I'm gonna move the saddle back just a bit. Put it back in the playing position. You wanna make sure that we're back in tune exactly. And I am. Still a little bit sharp. Still a little bit sharp at the 17th as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull that saddle back just a bit more. give it another shot. And anytime you move your saddle, you want to just make sure that your open string is back in tune because um, it's going to go out of tune with that saddle moving. Okay, so there we are. That is perfectly in tune on the 12th. Still a little sharper on the 17th than I would like, so I'm going to give it one more, one more go. 
And on this uh, adjustment, you want to make sure that you actually see the saddle moving. This is not the type of adjustment where you just do a tiny little bit of a turn. You actually want to see the saddle move a little bit, um, and then you know you're actually changing the intonation. Once you get it really close, you may need to do those very minute, uh, minute adjustments, but in the beginning, you want to make sure the saddle actually moves. Okay, there we are on the tuning. Perfect at the 12th fret and just barely sharp at the 17th. So that is that is a very well intonated. So now we'll move over to the B. Get that perfectly in tune. That is about as in tune as you can ever hope for. And then at the 17th fret, looks very good, just barely sharp. So kind of splitting the difference on those. And then lastly, we'll move over to our high E. Tiny bit sharp, a little bit sharp. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that saddle back a little bit. Um, so again, I'm gonna tighten, tighten this screw to pull the saddle back. Now retune. That's perfectly in tune at the 12th and just barely sharp at the 17th. So this guitar is very well intonated. Um, so just remember, if your fretted note is flat, you move the saddle forward towards the neck. If your fretted note is sharp, you move the saddle back away from the neck. So now that we've gotten through the adjustment process for the playability of the guitar by setting our truss rod, our neck relief, we've set our bridge radius and action height, we've cut the nut slots correctly, and we've set our intonation, it's now time to set our pickup heights. And pickup height is a very subjective uh, process. You're, you're basically, the end goal is that you set your pickups so that they have even output between them and they have even string to string balance. Now from guitar to guitar, the pickups may, they may look different. Maybe one guitar has a pickup that the treble size is a little higher or the bass size is a little higher or the neck's high or low. It just depends on the instrument and how your amp sounds. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of individual touch as far as pickup heights go. But we have some uh, good guidelines for getting you started uh, to get a good even output and you can go from there if you need to dial it in even further. So on a set of humbuckers, like on this uh, Gibson here, a good starting point is uh, a sixteenth of an inch away from the strings on the bridge pickup and three thirty seconds away from the strings on the neck pickup. Now the way to measure that is uh, with your string action gauge. You have a little ruler on the corner. Uh, one side is in inches and one side is in millimeters. We're going to use the inch side. And what we'll do is we're going to measure the pickup pull piece distance from the string. And we're going to set the bridge pickup at 1 16th and we're going to set the neck pickup at 3 30 seconds. I'll put the guitar in the playing position so that I can see it a little bit better. And I'm going to push down the outer E strings at the last fret. So then I will take my ruler, put it right on the pull piece. This pickup measures about 5 30 seconds from the string, so I'm too low. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this pickup up a little bit to get it uh, 1 16th of an inch away from the strings. Get my Phillips screwdriver. One thing to be extremely careful of, uh, some Gibsons and uh, some pickup makers provide screws that are flat bladed so they don't have a Phillips head, they have the slot head. You have to be really careful when you're adjusting your pickups to keep that screwdriver tip solidly seated in that screw. It's really easy to jump out and hit the top of the guitar, which you would just be sad. Um, so if you're using a flat blade uh, screw and flat blade screwdriver, just be really careful that you keep that seated in the screw. Phillips doesn't jump out like that, so you can actually just turn it by one with one hand. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and turn this and bring up this pickup until I get it a little closer and then I'll measure again. Uh, 
Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and measure. And now I'm sitting at about just a tiny bit over a sixteenth. So I'm going to raise it up just a bit more. So that's right at a sixteenth on the base side, a little low on the truck side. Let's bring that up just a bit more. <clears throat> the way the screw adjustment works on these humbuckers is the screw goes through the pickup ring and then into the pickup base. So as you tighten the screw, it lifts the pickup, and as you loosen the screw, it lowers the pickup. That's the same way with a Stratocaster or anything that has pickups that hang from a pickup ring or from a pick guard. Another way of mounting them is a body mount where the pickup screws go through the pickup into the body. And then you would tighten the screw to lower the pickup and you would loosen the screw to raise the pickup. So now I'll remeasure and see where I am on my heights. So I'm right at a 16th there. I'm right at a 16th there. So my high and low are both at a 16th. So now I'm going to go ahead and set my uh, neck pickup to 330 seconds. And this is way too close. So I'm going to drop this down. So I'm loosening the screw to lower the pickup. Just get a tiny bit more. side. Okay, so now I've got both of them set at 330 seconds on the neck pickup. So what I'll do is I'll turn on my amp and just give a little listen. So when your pickups are correctly adjusted, you're going to have a good full output. You're going to have a, a nice solid tone. Um, they're going to have, a, they're not going to sound weak or thin. So we'll listen to the, uh, the bridge pickup first. Then we can flip over to the neck. Those sound very even volume wise. So what you're looking for is when you switch between the pickups, you don't get a drastic jump in volume. So these are really well balanced. Uh, they have a good, um, they have a good tone uh, between the two pickups. One's not too trebly, one's not too bassy. So it's a really a nice sounding guitar. So if you did find that maybe your neck pickup sounded a little bassy or a little trebly, you can drop one side and raise the other, lower the bass, raise the treble, lower the treble, raise the bass. Um, if the neck pickup happened to be a lot louder than the bridge pickup, I could lower it further um, or I could raise the bridge pickup. You just have to mess around. You know, if it's too quiet, raise it. If it's too loud, lower it. So now we've made it through the entire setup process. Set our neck relief, bridge radius and action height, nut height, uh, intonation, pickup heights. So the keep it simple setup method makes it really easy to follow along in a linear fashion and take the setup process step by step so that you, the player, can take the gauges and tools and dial your guitar in to play and sound great for you. For detailed videos on how to use each gauge during the setup process, please visit musicnomadcare.com for all our how-to videos.